Good day, good evening, good afternoon, whatever time you may be watching us here on Facebook. Uh, we just finished having a tremendous men's meeting and a Sunday, uh, a Sunday meeting here at Maranatha Life Teaching Church in Dover, Delaware with uh, Pastors uh, Enio Maribel Saragossa. We had uh, a great move of God. And um, I have been friends with Pastor Enio and his wife now for about 30 years or more. Uh, and I've seen what God has done in their lives from uh, small beginnings. They were, they were meeting in a classroom. And I used to come down there and minister for them to uh, where they're at now, where God has enabled them to build a, a beautiful edifice here with a great congregation of great workers. Uh, but the reason we're have, making this video, because I've been after Pastor Anya for a long time to uh, get his, his testimony on book. And he's, he's in the process of doing that. But while I'm here, I wanted to catch it on video. So you can partake of this tremendous testimony. This is a Joseph testimony that he has. And I would encourage you, after hearing it, to share it with the people that God may lay on your heart. Some of these people may be in prison, uh, and, and it'll be a, a tremendous inspiration to them. Uh, so without further ado, I'm going to introduce my friend, uh, Pastor Enio and Maribel Saragossa, and let them share uh, what God has done in their lives. Pastor Enio. Al, thank you so much uh, for... Uh being here with us, you and your wife, and uh, we enjoy a couple of days of ministry. Uh, it's been tremendous. The services have been great. The Holy Spirit has moved in a tremendous way. Uh, my wife and I are very pleased with how uh, God used both of you to minister to our congregation. Uh, Al asked me to share our, our testimony uh, uh, with you folks, uh, and I'm very uh, happy to do that. Uh, God has been grace, graceful, and, and God, God has been a blessing to our lives, uh, from where He uh, took us to where we are now. Uh, I, uh, I met my wife while I was in prison. Uh, I've been in and out of uh, uh, detention center since I was uh, 16 years old, and uh, at the age of 18, I was incarcerated in a uh, men's penitentiary. And I uh, was uh, locked up for about uh, six and a half years. I came out when I was 24 years old. But, I, but in the process, something great happened. Uh, my, my life is a, is a blessing. My, my journey has been uh, tremendous. And I thank God. Uh, and I know that uh, sometimes uh, when you go through the situations like I went through, uh, you try to say, well, you know, where is, where is space for thankfulness? Well, I have a lot of space for thankfulness because from the very beginning that God demonstrated himself to me, it, it was totally a miracle, totally a, a God uh, instrument in my life. Uh, I remember when I was uh, uh, in the juvenile detention, and I turned 18 in the juvenile detention, and when I turned 18, uh, they uh, transferred me over to the men's prison, and in the way to the men's prison, uh, it was a very interesting situation because uh, for the first time in my life, I felt a loneliness that I have never felt before. Uh, you know, when you're in juvenile detention, there's a lot of care. It's like just like you're in high school, but you're locked up. But uh, the moment that, they trans that they're going to transfer you from juvenile to uh, the men's penitentiary, uh, it's a whole different uh, atmosphere, a whole different feeling. Wow. And I didn't know how to deal with that, Al. So, and that was in New York, right? No, that was here in Delaware. Oh, Delaware. Okay. Delaware, Southern Delaware. Okay. okay. Uh, so, uh, so I didn't know how to deal with that. So I remember when they uh, put me in the uh, state trooper's vehicle in the back seat, and I was looking out through the windshield, uh, I saw a big black hole. It was like... Uh, it was so dark, so black that uh, I couldn't see no hope and no light, no nothing. And all of a sudden, for the first time in my life, I felt a loneliness and a darkness that I couldn't control or, or understand. Wow. And at that moment, I started to break down because I get, the fear that I had of what was going to happen to me in the men's penitentiary overcame me. And from the, at that moment, I just broke down. I, my emotions... My my body, my mind just broke down, and and, and I started to lose control of myself wow. in in the back seat, and uh, and all of a sudden as I was crying and shaking and and fearful, 
a fear that surpasses you know what I could understand. Uh, wow. It was just a total darkness. And I remember the state trooper looking back and said, "Son, uh, just relax. Everything's gonna be okay." But those that those words were not enough. And as I was going through that process, I felt somebody sit, sit next to me. And I didn't see anybody there, but I felt somebody's presence. And that presence uh, said to me, uh, Ennio, don't be afraid. And the moment that I heard those voice, that voice, uh, all the fear, all the insecurity, everything just was just lifted from me. Wow. But I wasn't a Christian. I didn't know anything about God. I didn't grow up in church. My family never went to church. Uh, I came from a very uh, disturbed family, uh, very dysfunctional. And so I, I didn't know anything about spirituality and, and how God worked. Uh, and then after he had said that, he said to me, uh, Anio, the first person that says anything to you, jump on him. Now, I know those are... Uh, Sometimes some people it's funny, uh, but it's or interesting. Uh, but it, it, if you know my story, you'll see that that saved my life. And God was preparing me for uh, for a confrontation where where eventually He was going to touch my life, because at that moment I didn't know Jesus Christ. But I knew that those words were meant for me because they they penetrated my my life, they penetrated my heart in such a way that I felt confident. The fear was lifted from me. So they took me to the men's prison. And I went through receiving. You go through receiving where they give you your, your clothes, your soap, and uh, uh, the things that you need to, uh, to, uh, to live in the prison. A toothbrush and uh, uh, the T-shirt, your shoes. And uh, it was around 5 o'clock when I got there. And when, after they had processed me, it was almost about 5, 5.30, dinner time. So when they took me out of receiving, they uh, were walking me to my cell. And on the way to my cell, I had to go through the dining hall. And when I went through the, uh, as, as I was walking through the dining hall, uh, I walked in and there was a table on my left with six other prisoners. And the one at the end, real big guy, uh, looked up to me and, and said, Boy, you're going to be mine tonight. Oh, and at that God. moment, I remember what that voice said to me, that the first person that talks to you, jump on him. So that's exactly what I did. I jumped on him. And I, and I weighed about 145 pounds, 150 pounds at that time. And this guy was almost 300 pounds. But I, 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 I just, those words that were spoken to me in that trooper's uh, vehicle resonated through me. It just... Those words were guiding me, and I knew I had to do this. So I jumped on him. I grabbed him by the neck, and I just started punching him. Wow! But he was so big that you know I was nothing. I was like a, uh, I was. He just stood up, and I was still on top of him. And and so the guards took me off of him, and uh, and they they jumped on me and they held me down, and uh, and from there they took me to a solitary confinement. Uh, and solitary confinement, they call it also the hole. Uh, you know that because you, you, you've been, uh, you was a cop. And in solitary confinement, they call it the hole, the dark place, the box. And so they took me to solitary confinement. So the first week of my introduction to the men's penitentiary was spent in solitary confinement. And in that place, you don't get nothing. You're locked up. No, uh, it was just a small window, but you didn't have access to it. Uh, it's, uh, you only get a bunk, a sheet. A pillow and, and that's it and your food is given to you under the door and so I spent a whole week in that place and the other the other thing that was in that cell was uh, was a book and I, I I didn't know how to read well I didn't know how to write well because I dropped out of school and uh, but uh, but that book just seemed out of place everything else seemed it seemed like it was okay to be there but just, just that book was seen like it was out of place. So uh, after a week of being in solitary confinement, they came to get me out. And as I was walking out, I grabbed the book and, and, and I took it with me. Uh, and uh, I didn't know that it was a Bible because mm. I, I didn't know anything about God. And so I took the book with me and I put it under my pillow in my cell. 
And I remember as I was walking back, uh, as, they, as they were walking me to my cell, uh, I noticed that the prisoners would walk away from me. Hmm. Like, you know, like I had something wrong, with, like a disease or something. And so they would cross the hallway not to, to have contact with me. So when I get to my cell, I, uh, uh, I asked my cellie, I said, hey, why, why are the other prisoners avoiding me? And they said, no, no, they think you're crazy. <laughs> that guy that you dumped on was, is, is one of the worst guys in this whole place. Wow. So from that moment on, Al, nobody ever bothered me. <gasps> yeah. Nobody God. ever touched me. Nobody uh, tried to do anything to me. And so, uh, but I still did not know God. But as you can see, even when you don't know God, God is reaching out to you, oh, yeah. man. Amen. Yeah. God is reaching out to you, man. God yeah. Reaching... Yeah. Amen. Yeah. 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 God is an awesome God. Yeah. And he loves us tremendously. Yeah. And, um, and I remember that uh, I didn't know what else to do, so I was just following protocol. And, uh, but I got to a point where I decided that I was going to make prison my, my life because I didn't have nothing else to go to. I didn't have no, no family that, that I felt the support that could support me. Uh, nobody came to visit me. Uh, and so I just decided to make prison my life. I, I got a... A third, I got two 30 years uh, sentence to run consecutively. And so uh, I, I knew I was going to be there for a long time. And uh, I, I remember a guy in the prison said, said to me, he said, son, the best thing when you have a long time, just don't think about the outside no more. And so I, that's what I did. I, did I, I started just to think about my life in prison. And I was there. I, I got involved in uh, in a small job at the workshop. And uh and I just decided that that was going to be my life, and little little by little I began to I began to become institutionalized. And after being there uh, about uh, two years, after being there a year and a half of being in the prison, uh, I was laying in my bunk on my bed, and I a explain to them what institutionalized means because some of them probably don't know what that means. Institutionalized means that you be become. You become dysfunctional with the outside world, and and you need to be told exactly what to do hour by hour, minute by minute, uh, in order to be functional. And you give into that. It, you give into the into a system that guides your life and tells you exactly what to do every minute of it. You have you you give up your ability to make choices, wow. and and you accept uh, other uh, you accept another man's. Uh, way of life, and and they in this case, the uh, the institution's way of life, and so that's what I did. I gave myself into the institution, and uh, I remember I was laying on my bunk about a year, year and a half of being in that prison. I just got I just came down from my job. I used to, I worked at the wood shop, and uh, and I came down and I was laying down, and. I already had dinner. It was dinner was always at five o'clock, and uh, it was about six thirty. And as I was laying there resting my my head, I felt somebody grab my legs, and uh, I jumped up from my bed. And I always held a, a shank. A shank is a prison a made knife. And uh, I jumped up with my shank, and uh, uh, thinking, you know, who's grabbing my feet? So when I when I jumped up, I saw that it was a man that I always saw him in the corner reading a book, and everybody respected him, nobody bothered him. Uh, his name was Brother Robinson, and uh, he said, "No, uh, relax. I just want to invite you to a meeting." Of course, by that time, I was uh, uh, antisocial. I was very mean. I didn't want nothing to do with anybody. Uh, I. I gave up in relationships with anybody, and I, everybody was a threat to me. So I told him, I said, I don't want, I don't need to go to any meeting. Just leave me alone. I don't want to, I don't want to go any meetings. Uh, that's okay, thank you. And but he persisted. He said, No, no, no. You got to come to this meeting. You're gonna enjoy it. Uh, you need to hear what they have to say. And I kept saying, You know, I, I really, I'm really not interested. He said, No, no. But they're gonna have coffee and donuts, and you should come and grab your coffee eat a donut and then you can leave. So, you know, I haven't had a donut for about three years, so two, two and a half years, something like that. So I said, 
what, 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 what could have hurt? I just go eat a donut and leave. But I didn't know that once you get in that meeting, in, in that classroom, they lock the door behind them. And you can't, you can't get out until after it's done. <laughs> and so I sat in the back and uh, it was a Bible study. It was a Bible study. Uh, businessmen from the outside came in to give a Bible study once a week. And they, I sat in the back and I listened to them. And uh, I didn't understand nothing of what they were saying. Now. I mean, it's just for me, it was a foreign language. Because they were talking about the Holy Spirit. Talking about a man named Jesus that saved you and set you free. And I know no Jesus. The only Jesus I knew was Jesus back in my cell. <laughs> you know? Uh, and, and they're talking, you know, I, I, it was crazy talk to me because uh, a man that sets you free, how can that happen? I'm locked up. You know, so I'm saying, so I, I'm listening, but not listening. You know, because that didn't make no sense. So I sat there after they got done. It was a Pentecostal type group. When they got done preaching, they made an altar call. And uh, and my brother Robinson, uh, he was a much older man than me. I was very young. I was only 19 at that time. And he was in his 40s. And uh, he sat next to me. And uh, God was using him. You know, he probably didn't know and I didn't know. But God was using him to help me make a decision in my life. Because when they made the altar call, Brother Robinson started banging on my leg. And he said, boy, get up there. You need to get prayed for. Boy, get up there. You need to get prayed for. And I said, man, I don't, I don't want to go up there. I don't, I, don't, I don't need to get prayed for. He said, no, no, you need to get prayed for, man. Get up there. Go, go. Get up there. So, you know, uh, uh, Brother Robinson was a very strange man. It was a guy that was there for killing shooting his wife and her boyfriend when he caught him in bed and and he shot him twice each and then turned himself in and uh and he he, he was a, a very in, interesting fellow nobody bothered him and everybody respected him so i didn't want to i felt that i felt at that moment that i didn't want to upset him so i said well i'll go up there and, and get prayed for <laughs> <laughs> and uh and when I get up to the front, uh, the leader of the meeting, uh, past, uh, uh, Brother Al Green was his name, says to me, he says, son, what would you like me to pray for you about? And I didn't know what to say. So I just told him, I said, well, pray for me about what you've been talking about. And because uh, really, I just wanted to get out of that meeting, get out of there. So he said, okay, raise your hand and you're going to repeat after me. And after you repeat that to me, I'm going to lay my hands on you, and your life is never again going to be the same. Well, those are mighty words. But I didn't understand what he was talking about. So I lifted up my hands, and I repeated the prayer of salvation with him. And when I got done repeating, he laid his hand on my head. And when he laid his hand on my head, beloved, it was like a lightning bolt went through my body. I heard the shot, bam! I, it lifted me up from the ground, and I fell back down, and they were, and, and, and I was out. Mm -hmm. I don't know how long I was out, uh, but when I got up and, uh, and and got a hold of myself, my life was never again the same. Wow! God. Amen. Totally, God. totally changed. Uh, I and I felt it inside. I felt it that, that something. Something great had just happened. And from that moment on, I got a hunger for the Word of God. I got a hunger to know more about Jesus. Uh, I, I just, my focus from that moment on became about all about Jesus and the Word of God. I read the Word of God from cover to cover. You know, I, I got involved with the Bible study. I couldn't wait to go to a Bible study after that. <laughs> And, and and the men that were there began to, uh, God began to use them to disciple me. Praise God. And during that first year, they they, they worked with me to 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 help me know more about God and about Christ, and and so they they disciple me. A year later, uh, but a year later, uh, after my my conversion. 
brother, uh, uh, my brother gets released from prison. Brother Robinson, uh, through a miracle of God, uh, they they allow him to uh, get released. He got early, he got released early, but by but by that time it was uh, it was almost a year after, and by that time, I uh, they had already discipled me. And I became the leader of the Christian community because Brother Robinson was the leader of the Christian community. Praise God. So uh, after a year's time, I became the leader. He got released, and I began to take care of the church in the prison. Praise God. Yeah. So you were like 20, 21? By that time, I was 20 years old. 20 years old. 20 years old, yeah. Uh, and, uh, and so that's what I did. And so I got involved in the, in the church in the prison. I got involved in ministry, evangelizing. Winning uh, guys to the Lord, uh, taking care of new new uh, new inmates coming in, and so the administration began to trust me more and more. I got a lot more. I I, I got a lot of privileges. I was one of the few prisoners was able to walk out of my cell anytime I wanted to to visit other other parts of the prison to minister to people, um, and so God began to do a work in my life, and so as the leader of the uh, of the church. I also became the leader of the Hispanic community because I'm Puerto Rican, and in those days, in the prison, I was in the prison in the South, and there were no programs or no help for Hispanics. If you were Hispanic and you didn't speak English, they just fed you your three meals a day, and they didn't bother with you. They didn't worry about your sickness. They didn't worry about your problems. Nothing. They just gave you your meals, and they just did what it was, uh, what they had to do. That's it. So I became the leader of the Hispanic community. I began to work with the Hispanic community, began to solicit the governor and other officials for help. Uh, and so uh, God began to work with me and began to open doors for me to be able to make changes in the prison. I was the first person that ever got baptized, water baptized in that prison because wow. I got so hungry for the word of God that everything I saw that Jesus did, I wanted to do. Praise God. So I saw that Jesus got baptized and I needed to get baptized. So I began to bother the administration. I said, look, the Bible says that Jesus Christ got baptized in water, submerged. And now I'm a Christian. And now I am a, a, a believer in Jesus Christ. And I'm a follower of Jesus. And the Bible says that I should imitate him. And I need to get baptized Amen. in water, submerged. So the administration brought a baptistry into the prison to baptize me. So I was the first person to get baptized in that in that in that prison, and so wow. God began to open doors like that, and um, and through the process of being a leader in the prison, uh, the governor began to help us, uh, the Hispanic community, and I uh, uh, I began to start programs, the ESL program, English as a Second Language program. I had brothers come in and, and work with me, and so but still we needed somebody that could be there full time and work with us. And so the governor, through the uh, program here that we'll call the Governor's Hispanic. The uh, Governor's Council of Hispanic. Governor's Council of Hispanic Affairs. And so uh, they they uh, invited me to a meeting at the Capitol and uh, to talk to them about what was going on in the prison with Hispanics. So uh, guards took me to the Capitol and, and uh, and I be, and I talk, and I spoke to them, and I spoke to uh, the the committee there about the problems with the prison, and so they decided to, uh, at that moment, to uh, assign somebody to the prisons that was going to help us uh, with our problems, and so, so they they assigned my wife was our counselor, and so I met my wife in prison. Oh. She was uh, she was the one that was instrumental in helping me with the other. With the prisoners, the Hispanic oh, uh, community so there, sweet. and that's how we met. That's great. And, oh, uh, and, and so we fell in love, and uh, it, that's a miracle in itself how we met and how God brought her there. And I'll let her explain that. But uh, uh, we did. We fell in love, and uh, after I got out of prison, I got after I met her. I got out a year after on my birthday, November twentieth. Praise God. Wow. Praise God. 1981. 1981. Yeah. And uh, she's, she was uh, uh, waiting to get accepted to medical school. So after a year of being with me, she got accepted into a medical school. And she went to medical school. And I got out. And uh, both, we stayed in touch. 
and, and God made it possible for us to uh, continue our relationship and get married. And uh, we have two uh, wonderful sons that work with us in the ministry. And uh, God has Please, yeah. opened doors for us to have a tremendous uh, church with people that uh, love God and 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 uh, love working in the community. And so I'm I'm very very blessed and I'm very Amen. thankful for what God has done in my life. But uh, I like let my wife talk a little bit about uh, our relationship and uh, and how God has moved in our lives. Yes, please. Well, it was miracle after miracle. Um, how God does things is it amazes me every day. It never ceases to amaze me how God works. Um, we come from very different backgrounds. Uh, I was a Christian since I was 11 years old. I gave my life to the Lord. I got baptized. I was very active in church. But then I turned 16. I, I went to college very early. I went to college when I was 16. Finished um, um, my undergraduate when I was very young. I was 19. I wanted to be a, a physician, a doctor. Since I was five years old, I told my mother I wanted to be a physician. So I came to Delaware, and it was, when I look back, it's just like Joseph, um, how God was, I didn't understand why my other friends were all applying to medical school in Puerto Rico, and I just, for some odd reason now, you know, years later, I understood why God um, was pushing me to come to Delaware. I have a cousin who's a physician here in in we never we were never close we but god wanted put that in my heart that i needed to come here and um and be my my reason to come here was i was going to go to medical school in temple university because she went there and and that was the plan that i had but god had another plan amen so uh it took me quite a while to be to find a job here um, because since I finished, I decided to, to uh, work a year because they, I was getting everything ready to try to get into medical school. Later on, found out they wanted me to stay another year uh, to do undergraduate, and, and I decided just to go to another medical school. But in the meantime, I got this job with the Governor's Council on Hispanic Affairs, and they wanted me to help them reach out to the Hispanic community. And one of the first meetings that we had was with this inmate that was going to speak to us about all the conflicts and all the crises that the Hispanic inmates were having in prison. And um, they were not giving any health care, and there was a lot of disparity in the prison system of the Hispanics. So when I got to the meeting, I see that um, these two guards come in with an inmate that was very handsome. And, um, and, you know, in my mind, I was thinking, you know, he doesn't look like an inmate. He doesn't look like a, somebody that is, belongs in prison. And he looks like a guard. And um, then, you know, we were there. Um, we started the meeting, and then he started uh, speaking. And I was very impressed the way he was speaking. And while I'm sitting there, um, I don't know who he is. I don't even know his name until he started talking. The Lord speaks to me. And at that time, to be honest, I had departed. I had backslid in the sense that I was not going to church. My cousin, you know, was not a Christian. She was, they were not church attenders. And, um, but I had backslid from the Lord. And, but I always, I always loved the Lord so much. I think I always say that those years that I departed from his presence were the darkest years of my life. And it was from 16 to 23. And, um, but the Lord spoke to me that day, and he says, he's going to be your husband. Just like that. And I'm like, what? <laughs> <laughs> he's going to be your husband. And, um, and I was shocked. So the next meeting that we had, we had a meeting that was very unusual because he was an inmate that there was a felony and had a long, you know, long term to complete. And they allowed us to be in the room by ourselves. And and that was it. That day we started talking. Sorry. Praise God. Right. Praise God. Hallelujah. 
Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. We started talking, and the most important thing for me was that he was a Christian, that he loved the Lord, and that he was committed to, to serve the Lord. Praise God. And that's what really touched my heart. And um, I also was asked the Lord, I always wanted a Latino man for some reason. I wanted a Latino man with brown eyes, tall, and he had all the things that I asked the Lord for. Praise and God. The, um, the Lord right there and then confirmed that we were going to be together for life. Mm. It's very strange. People don't understand it when we explain it. Because it was the first time we talked. Wow. The first time that we were able to see each other and, and share even our names and, and, you know, who really, what was in our hearts. And I remember that meeting, it was, it was in, in a meeting that directed the rest of our life. So from that moment on, um, we kept, I kept going to prison. I had to release my position from the Governor's Council on Hispanic Affairs because um, I was involved with him. And I started going to, to prison to a meeting to help him get out. And it's interesting to know um, the year before he had gone for early parole because he was, you know, very loved in prison and everybody admired him. But he was denied. And it was because um, he needed to wait for me to wow. the next, the following wow. year, 1980, when we met. We met in the, um, around the Christmas season of 1980. And um, then that 1981, we started working really hard for him to to be released and you know it was miracle after miracle because you know there are a lot of obstacles he when he came to the parole board um it's an, an amazing story too he was um there was five members there were six members but in the meeting there was only five and there was one of the counselors um that really was talking uh, very much against him um, saying that he was a con, that this Christianity was all false, and that and it was always smiling and always happy, but it was all an act to try to get out of prison. And so three of the people voted. Um, there was a seven. Five, seven. five people. Uh, uh, two voted for me, two voted against me. Exactly. There was five people on the, in the parole board, I'm sorry. And then two voted in favor, two against so there was one vote that was gonna make the difference. And um, so, you know, and, and this was something else that really impacted in his life. There was Christians, Christians were going to prison. And you know, I'm talking to you Christians, do you need to go to prison? You need to visit the inmates like the Bible says. And there was a Mennonite church, Methodist church, our brother Green, that God used him. And we have another story because he's been in this church. And what God revealed to him, it was, it's just short of amazing. Um, so he, when, when he came back, the, the group from the Mennonite church um, came to visit him and said, Amy, anyway, what's going on? What did the parole board say? And he said, well, um, there are five members, but there was one missing, but two voted against and two in favor. And so we're waiting for that one person. And she said, and what's his name? When he said his name, they said, Anyo. Just pack your things. He's a member of our church, and we're going to be talking to him. Praise God. So he was on vacation in Miami. The sisters waited for him, and they talked to him, and he voted in favor of Enio. Amen. And Enio was released on his birthday, like he said, on 11 20, 1981. And our journey began at uh, that time. Um, it's been... Many years we've been together. I always say that we've been together since the day that we decided to be together in the eyes of the Lord. And we've been together since 1981. So we've been together 41 years. And um, we yeah. had an awesome journey. And right now, you know, the Lord called us to be pastors. We've been pastoring for uh, 20 years. And we have two wonderful children. Very wonderful church. And But let me tell you something. The best is yet to come. Yes, it is. Amen. And I thank the Lord Praise for God. what God has done. 
and he's worthy to be praised. And if you're hearing this, let me tell you, God has a plan for you. Yes. And the enemy has been trying to destroy identity. Is the plan, is the last plan, which is a very powerful plan to try to destroy your identity. And destroy your identity is for your purpose. And we are here to tell you, God, God has a plan for your life. And God has a prophetic destiny for you. That is an awesome, awesome plan. And just like he did it for us, he can do it for you. You just have to believe and you have to just let go of your own plans and allow him to show you the plan, the wonderful plan that he has for your life. Amen. He has done a wonderful work in our life. And I'm telling you, it's the best life you can have. Amen. And it's Amen. the best is just to come here and then in heaven. Amen. 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 I, I just want to say something. You know, this is a man <clears throat> that was serving two consecutive 30-year sentences. Is that correct? Yes. 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 No high school, dropped out, you know, in prison since he was 16 years old, 16. right? Mm -hmm. um, and then possible, and, and yet God intervened. And and not, all, not only did he get him out of jail, give him a great wife, get saved, but he had been a sick, he just retired just a couple of days ago, about two days ago, right? Mm -hmm. Right. Successful businessman. This guy, every time I came here to preach, he was in a new business. He had a restaurant. He had a successful uh, insurance company with uh, two offices or three? Four. Four offices. Tax wow. business. Tax business. I mean, how many employees? Uh, 30. 30 employees. He just retired. Uh, and so, entrepreneurial. Pastor of church. So, God can work miracles if somebody surrenders totally to God. That's Amen. the bottom line. That's what they Amen. did. They surrendered their will to the Lord. And God moved on them they they flowed with god and look what god has done so i want i wanted them to get this testimony out to me and i'm looking forward to preaching the uh, uh publishing the book because i want to promote it because this testimony needs to get the hands of many many people that it's going to inspire people to believe maybe you're in a hopeless situation in prison even and you hear that this is going to inspire your faith to trust god and believe god because nothing is impossible with god and all things okay. are possible then who believes? Amen. Do you have any last words you want to say? I just want to say thank you, Al, for uh, allowing us to be able to share this testimony. Uh, that you know, God is great. Uh, uh, when God has His hand over you, uh, He will protect you. He will keep you. Uh, you know, I wasn't expecting to get out of prison. I wasn't looking to get out. Uh, and uh, but God had His time. And uh, God had his time, and he was do uh, during that time he was working in my life. Uh, and and when he brought my wife to uh, uh, to me, and uh, and we got together, uh, you know, it was time. Because uh, I, I remember it's something funny because, you know, literally I didn't care about getting out of prison. I was already by the time she came into my life, I was totally institutionalized. I didn't have no desire to get out. I didn't know how to get out. Matter of fact, when I did get out, I I stood up in my bed in the room where I had, a friend I had provided all night, waiting to see when the bell for breakfast was gonna come. <laughs> <laughs> I was totally institutionalized. You were programmed. Yeah, I was pro. I was programmed. But the moment that my wife came into my life, it was like something clicked. It said, "Wait a minute." I have all this wrong. I gotta get out of here. I need <laughs> <laughs> so God is good, beloved. And yeah. you know, I encourage you. Uh, don't give up. You might be in a situation like uh, Al just mentioned, where uh, things are difficult, and maybe you don't see it, a, an end, or you don't see the light at the end of the tunnel. Don't give up. Right. Keep running. Keep pushing. That and putting God first. And I guarantee you that something will happen. Amen. God bless you and thank Amen. you so much. Amen. Thank you Amen. so much for joining us. We, we plan on doing this in Spanish also. So uh, please share this message with others because uh, through social media, I believe, email it to, to people. I believe it's going to help and inspire many. Amen. And we're going to be writing that book. Yes. Amen. 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 Before I um, finish this, uh, I would like to ask you to pray for I don't know, people that don't know Jesus and they need to pray for yeah. salvation. Yeah. Okay. Who wants to yeah, make an altar call? Yeah. Father, we just thank you this evening. Yes, Lord. And we glorify your name. 
And we are so grateful, Lord, that we're able to share what you've done in our lives. And we pray for every brother, every sister, every person that's hearing us right now. That as they hear this message, as they hear what you have done in our lives, Father, that that will touch their lives and that they will see hope. Father, and that they will change their ways and make a, com a decision to accept Jesus Christ into their lives. Lord, I pray for that mother that is lonely. I pray for that husband that is thinking of what to do with his life. I pray for that young man who's lost and doesn't know uh, what turns to take in life. And I just, I, I pray hope into their lives right now. Yes. And that their lives will never again be the same. Amen. In Amen. Jesus' name, amen. amen. If you're watching right now, you've never made Jesus the Lord of your life. Just say, Lord Jesus, very simple prayer from your heart. Say, Lord Jesus, come into my heart. I believe in you. Be my Lord and Savior. Yeah. Just a simple prayer from your heart, and he'll come in and do what he did for him. Yeah. He'll turn your life around. Maybe you're a backslider. Maybe you did what she did some years back. You fell away from God. Okay. Well, come back to God. It's not too late. Just say, God, forgive me. I repent of my sins. And come running back like yes. the prodigal son, and God will forgive you. Yes. Amen. Amen. God bless you. Thank you for joining us. And God again, share you. this message with many. Amen.